uh, dean of the College of Natural Resources, has uh, interacted with our speaker over many, many years and uh, wants to introduce him. Alan? Thank you, Ken. Well, George and I go back almost 30 years. I think it was about 28 years ago that uh, when I first came to Wisconsin and George made it a point of coming up and getting acquainted. And he and I have uh, interacted from time to time ever since then. Uh, it's impossible to give George Meyer a brief introduction. So George, forgive me if I'm going to steal a little bit of your time. Um, because I think it's important. I think it's important, first of all, that we set the stage and we know what we're dealing with. Wisconsin, for many, many, many years, was seen as the state in which conservation was a primary focus, a, prior, a priority for state government, uh, for public officials, and so forth. And uh, we became known for that, not only in the United States, but uh, elsewhere and around the world to some extent. Where it started is a little hard to say. The early years of conservation in this country were fraught with a lot of controversy over how many deer and which species or which uh, uh, sex of deer should be shot. And that took us right up to uh, through the early Leopold years, but certainly with Sand County Almanac, which didn't receive very much attention, but which has gradually increased in the amount of attention it's received, uh, has certainly established Wisconsin as a, as a conservation state to be reckoned with. But unfortunately, things have changed and they continue to change. But I'd like to, I'd like to elaborate a little bit upon that change. If we go back and look at one of the first conservation activities in the state, it was soil and water conservation. Mel Cohey, the establishment of the Coon Creek uh, watershed, uh, which became a national model for uh, soil and water conservation that, that has continued for, for many, many years. And so Wisconsin became known as a conservation state. state. And then Fred Smeekley at uh, UW-Stevens Point uh, developed the conservation education program. And many of you were involved with that or certainly knew about it. Uh, many of you are old enough to remember Fred Smeekley and some of those activities that went on there. That has continued. So we continue to do environmental education. In fact, we've developed environmental education as a national model again. So again, Wisconsin was known for that and continues to be known to a considerable extent about that. Then we came up into the 60s, and in the 60s, several things happened. First of all, the Wisconsin DNR was officially uh, developed and recognized in 1967. Uh, prior to that, it was the Department of Conservation, uh, so that was a rather minor shift. But it came at a time when uh, Silent Spring had just been published, Rachel Carson's book. And three years later, we had uh, uh, The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich and so forth. And so. Things really got going there in the late 60s going into the 70s. A very turbulent time, a time when lots of conservation and environmental activity was going on, not only in the state, but also around the country. George Meyer enters the scene about this point. George was born on a farm, um, and, uh, in a, dairy, a small dairy farm uh, in New Holstein. Uh, he grew up there, and from his parents, he gained a very, very strong work ethic. Uh, I uh, know a lot of people in my lifetime, and I have to say I don't know anybody that works any harder than George Meyer, and his work, it seems to me, is consistently directed toward the environment, conservation, and related activities. This is a man who is tireless in his effort to protect the environment and to uh, get the policies in place and enforced as they should be in a state that's known for its conservation. So George uh, did his early work uh, at St. Norbert's, uh, studying business and economics. Then he went to Madison and worked on a law degree. While he was working on his law degree at Madison, he interned with the DNR. This was back about 1970. George, I don't remember the exact date. But uh, 1972, after he finished his law degree, George went to work for the DNR as a uh, Basically, a law clerk. He, he, he was uh, he was doing legal work for the for the DNR at a time when there was a lot of legal work that needed to be done. And for the next uh, eight years or so, he continued in that capacity. He decided then he wanted more responsibility. He wanted to have an opportunity to get involved in more things. And so he shifted over and uh, became the assistant uh, supervisor of the Department of Enforcement, the Division of Enforcement, which 
If you know anything about the DNR, you know that that's where the rubber meets the road. The policies are enforced through the work of the people in that particular division. And George was insistent, but within a year, he was moved up to become the director of the department uh, or a division of enforcement. <coughs> and so uh, he immediately began to cut his teeth in terms of administration and dealing with all the controversies and the legalities and everything that go on with administering the policies that protect our resources and our environment here in Wisconsin. He did that uh, until 1993. Now, I don't know, I suspect looking around that many of you remember what went on in Wisconsin in the 80s. That was when things really blew up with regard to the Indian treaty rights. And there was tremendous controversy and almost came to blow. There was almost physical violence. In fact, there may have been at times. But it was when the Indians were trying to exercise their treaty rights for hunting and fishing in northern Wisconsin, which included spearing walleyes. And that really didn't sit well with a lot of the sports types uh, in Wisconsin. And they were, there were actually uh, conflicts at the boat landings when the Indians were going out to do their spearing with uh, people that were there trying to oppose this. This man was right in the middle of that controversy. As a, as a senior administrator in the DNR, he didn't hide behind a desk and he didn't sit at home when the, when the going got rough. He was there at those boat landings making sure that things were going well. The end result of that period of turbulence that went on for quite some time was that it was resolved peacefully. Uh, there, were, there were negotiations, endless negotiations and, and uh, uh, trials and tribulations of every kind you can imagine. But in the end, Wisconsin as a state came out of that looking pretty darn good. We managed to work with the Native Americans. We managed to allow them to exercise their treaty rights. And everybody seemed to be more or less satisfied, thanks to the hard work of George Meyer. And for that reason, Tommy Thompson, who was then governor, asked George to become the director, the secretary of the DNR. So in 1993, George became the, the DNR secretary. Now, he was the first person to be appointed by a governor to that position. Up until that point, the director, the, uh, the secretary of the DNR was appointed by the Natural Resources Board. So George was the first person to be appointed by a governor. And as an aside, he was also the first person to be fired by a governor. <laughs> <laughs> he lasted in that job until 2001 when Scott McCollum decided that he wasn't the right man for the job. And so uh, he was allowed to, to leave the DNR after many, many years in the trenches. I should say that during the time that George was director, lots and lots of good things happened in Wisconsin. I, I can't begin to share them all with you because the list is far too long. But I would like to just give you a little tidbit, a little taste of some of the things that George Byer did while he was Secretary of the DNR. He was a consistent, strong advocate for the environment and for our natural resources during that entire period. Somebody once told me that during the first year that he was Secretary, he gave 240 public presentations around the state to various groups and organizations on, on uh, various policy and environmentally related issues and so forth. I doubt that there is anybody in this state who knows this state better than George Meyer who is crisscrossing back and forth over and over and over again going out to meet with and to work with these various constituencies uh, th that were there. During his tenure, 150,000 acres were added to the uh, public protection lands of Wisconsin uh, through the stewardship program. Many of these protected undeveloped lakes and lake shores in northern Wisconsin, which would have otherwise have been developed, and we wouldn't have some of these pristine uh, lake shores and bodies of water that we now have in the, in the state. Through George's emphasis on controlling and curtailing urban sprawl, Wisconsin developed a land management program which became Smart Growth. Many of you remember Smart Growth. Uh, that was, again, a national model, and other states would look at smart growth and say it's a good idea. We don't have smart growth today. He created the Bureau of Remediation and Redevelopment to try and reclaim or remediate some of the problems that we had in the state with brownfields. 24,000 acres of brownfield were remediated in the state of Wisconsin, thanks to the leadership of George. <clears throat> George has consistently, through his career, been a strong advocate for women. 
When he came into the DNR, there were relatively few females that were in uh, senior positions in the DNR. By the time he was finished being secretary, half of the bureaus were directed by females. And so this has been a consistent pattern of George. He recognizes the importance of diversity and of having women involved in these critical decisions involving conservation and natural resources. After leaving his position in DNR in 2001, uh, George took a two-year appointment at Lawrence University as a visiting professor, and then he was asked by the Wisconsin Federation, Wildlife Federation to become the executive director. This has been a tremendous move for Wisconsin because now in that capacity, George Meyer can continue to lobby and to advocate and do the hard work of trying to help politicians do, make right decisions, make the correct decisions, and help people understand the problems that we have and the policies and, and solutions that we need to be seeking. And so George has continued this, and I suspect George, you're traveling as much across this state now as you ever did. Uh, so he is a continued uh, force to be reckoned with in the state for those reasons. And one other thing that George has been known for, he has believed firmly in the importance of getting young people involved in environmental protection and uh, uh, management and policy matters related to our natural resources and the environment. And among other things that he's done in that regard, he was one of the people that was instrumental in the uh, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation is in setting up the Wisconsin Conservation Leadership Corps. This idea brings uh, outstanding young people who are seniors in high school or freshmen, sophomores, or juniors in college who have an interest in the environment and environmental careers, bring them together with experienced and senior people who are <laughs> professionals in conservation and allowing them to interact and to work together to review policies and to develop policies that may continue to help protect our environment. 52 young people in Wisconsin have gone through this program to, uh, to date, and it's a program that George remains very, very active with and continues to participate in, along with his many other responsibilities. Among his many honors and recognitions, George was recognized by the Wisconsin Outdoor Journal as one of the top 20 conservationists in Wisconsin, and it's well deserved. We are so fortunate tonight to have with us George Meyer to talk about a topic that I have uh, spent a lot of wakeless nights thinking about myself. What happened to conservation in Wisconsin? George Meyer. Well, that's a high point of the night. Huh? Thank you very much for doing that. Very wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, you here? Folks here in the, everybody here? Can you hear the mic? Okay, just let me know if it needs to go up. Louder? Up. I'll try. We've been having some technical difficulties here. Can you... <coughs> Let's see, which one do you have? Younger? Is this better if I move it up? Yes. 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 Okay, I just moved it up, I try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm lost it now. <laughs> oh, sorry. One, two, three? Good. Yeah. Good. Hey, once again, thank you very much, Alan, for a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to the Aldo Leopold Audubon Society. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I see several old friends in the room. One of my bosses in the room, Bob Ellenson, uh, uh, is one of the directors of the uh, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and his dad, Bob Ellenson, has been a long time friend. The day I came secretary, walked in with some flowers from the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. I'll never forget that. Only one error in your uh, in the introduction. I was first appointed by the Natural Resources Board in 1993, and I have the distinction, the only distinction probably, of being the last Natural Resources Board appointed secretary and the first governor's appointed secretary. A little side note to that. Uh, I was not in favor of a governor appointed secretary. Uh, and um, neither was Herb Banky, who was chairman of the Natural Resources Board. And we fought it. Now, you got to remember, this was a governor who had both houses of the legislature. A very popular, powerful governor. This was not a 
Fred career move to Fulton's, right? We fought it anyway. That was the right thing to do. And I, I was the wingman for her, who was an outstanding conservation leader. He's in the Conservation Hall of Fame. We lost that vote by one vote in the Assembly and the Senate. We almost won. And then, the only time I ever ran a political campaign, uh, talked to all my friends uh, in organizations, maybe all the local uh, uh, Audubon Society, I want to use I wrote letters to every group. The governor got 1,500 letters saying, hire them now. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for the job. <laughs> um, Jim Colzer was Secretary of the Department of Administration and uh, was governor's main advisor. He came out to be really sort of upset. George, that's very unbecoming to lobby for a job like that. When I saw the governor, though, he smiled and said, you did that, right? <laughs> so, well, I'm talking about a topic that is, um, it's bothersome to me that we have to be talking about it. What happened to conservation uh, in Wisconsin? It shouldn't be that way. Alan mentioned the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, when I inherited from an excellent secretary, Buzz Pizzani, who's also in the Conservation Hall of Fame, uh, it was, it was uh, viewed in the country, uh, it's one of the few uh, agencies, natural resource agencies, that has both the environmental protection functions and the conservation functions in the country. That was done in 1969, as Alan mentioned. And it was viewed as being one of the top five natural resources, uh, uh, conservation organizations, one of the top five environmental organizations. Now I talk to people from other states and conservation departments, they don't say that anymore. Um, best at mediocre and some think it's below that. So we have really gone downhill in a very short period of time. Amazingly short period of time. And I'll sort of jump a little bit ahead to what what you saw happen here is it is the blueprint for what's happening in Washington D.C. right now. Same, same blueprint. Um, I was asked if I should, uh, if I had audio visual. I do have slides to go with this. Came, I've given this talk about three or four times, and I get a comment. Those are pretty depressing slides. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. Besides, it takes more time. Um, well, let's start. Oh, how many of you ever saw the movie The Perfect Storm? Great movie. I thought it was one of my favorite movies. For those that um, haven't seen it, it's about 26 years ago. It's a true story. 26 years ago, almost in this period of time, in fact, at this period of time, a, uh, a boat, the Andrea Gale, left the Gloucester Harbor uh, of Massachusetts, and the captain was Frank W. Billy Tyne, Jr. This is a fishing boat. There were five other uh, crew members on board. They were going to the Outer Banks, you know, off of Nova Scotia, that area, for fishing. And they uh, were left on September 20th, and they usually go out for a month or so. Um, wasn't a very good month for them. They were not catching a little fish. They stayed out probably longer than they thought. And then a storm came in. Now, if you're familiar with New England, or maybe some people from New England, New England and uh, uh, Eastern Canada has what's called nor'easters. These are major storms coming in from the northern Atlantic down and blew some pretty steady, heavy gales and rain. But, you know, these are New England fishermen. They, they can handle that, right? But they're out there, you know, hundreds of miles from harbor. But what happened is something that rarely, if ever, happens. You had this North Easter came in, and at the same time, a hurricane came up. Hurricane Chris. It wasn't a heavy hurricane, but it was a hurricane. And one of the few times these two storms, one from the north, one from the south, merged. And there was the angry gale trying to get back to shore. It was the perfect storm. 
steady waves of 30 feet with the waves hitting 60 feet. It's a 72 foot boat. It called in, people were trying to reach them. Uh, Coast Guard could not get out there in those kind of conditions and they all went down. Well, we're facing that perfect storm here in Wisconsin in terms of natural resources management. Alan and others that are here would tell you if they, you know, knowing me personally, I am an optimist. Always have been. Tell you, it's getting hard to be an optimist. Very hard. I still am. But you really got to dig deeper. Let me start out by talking about our Department of Natural Resources now and what's happened over the last few years. Now, just so you know, I work for a non-profit organization, a 501c3. We are apolitical when it comes to electoral politics. I personally approach my job when I was in DNR ever since as not being political on one side or the other. What I will be talking tonight are things that are factual and it's put in that context. We uh, just had a secretary leave to go to EPA in Kansas City. Uh, and with the, uh, uh, her stated purpose of bringing the EPA what she did to the DNR administration, which is not something I think EPA uh, employees will, will appreciate. During that tenure, that period, and what I'm talking about is a lot of this falls on the DNR and the administration, but clearly uh, the legislature was very heavily involved in at least a lot of the policy making that took place that's been detrimental for natural resources. And I can tell you if you're secretary of DNR, you, can, you can't control the legislature for sure, and uh, if you have strong-willed people, they will make things happen. But when it came to, one of the things I really have had, and have from my having been in that chair, and having seen people like uh, Les Boyd, uh, prior Secretary Tony Earl, uh, uh, Buzz Bazadney, uh, and which I tried to continue, is yes, you do get terrible legislation at times, you get proposed budget cuts, your job is to fight that. Sometimes you have to do it behind the scenes. You got to use discretion. Sometimes you got to be out there. Uh, like her banking, I were in 1995 when the uh, change was made. Um, that did not happen, and that's one of the uh, criticisms I've had with the former uh, secretary. And uh, uh, hopefully that will change. Uh, with the new secretary, and I'm willing to talk uh, about the new secretary liar. Um, during the tenure, that tenure, um, remarkable number of cut of, of employees of the department. Uh, to put it in perspective, when I was secretary, we probably hit the highest level of authorized positions. It doesn't mean we had them all on board at any one time, but there are 3,300 authorized positions. Now the level of authorized positions is 2,600. 700 positions cut, and the responsibilities are growing dramatically. When I was secretary, we had five capos, those are jam operations. Now they're in 100. Nobody had thought of frac sand mining. On and on of new major programs that have cut, have come, and fewer and fewer people uh, to deal with them. Uh, there's only 2,300 of those 2,600 positions filled. And yes, that's done in the state budget and that's passed by the legislature, but many of those were proposed in the governor's budget, which the secretary had a lot of input in. And uh, when uh, she testified before the legislature, she defended these things. It wasn't like begrudgingly either. 
Uh, it's amazing the things that are reported these days. As we all know, there's nothing secret. Um, but there are tapes of staff meetings where the secretaries say, why do we need research scientists in the Department of Natural Resources? Why do we need educators, environmental educators, in the Department of Natural Resources? I'm not going to, you know why, so I'm not going to explain it. It's pretty <laughs> obvious the importance of those. Uh, the Science Bureau was cut in half and actually has almost disappeared. They're just a really small presence of what it was. There are no environmental educators in the Department of Natural Resources. All their education programs, actually, we've taken some over through a group called the Green School Network, which is a part of Wisconsin Wildlife Federation. They had a great, and look up E, E E K, Environmental Education for Kids. That's now uh, being run through the Green School Network, which is part of our organization. Uh, some of these programs, Operation Wild, uh, Operation Wet, or Project Wet. Project Wet, Project Wild, and what's the forestry one? I should know that. Maybe. Those are all run now by the Green School Network, but, you know, and it's going to be run. There's some really great people. I, they they do their own thing. We just sort of are their fiscal agent and give them a little 501c3 status. But here's the Natural Resource Agency giving all that away. It has be, it became a highly political administrative. Uh, run agency. I'm not going to tell you that there wasn't politics when I was there, but a lot less. And I always viewed the job of secretary to sort of be that buffer. Let the politicians deal with me. I don't like them dealing with the people getting the work done. That, wasn't, that isn't the case anymore. Um, and when, this, when Governor Thompson, who I have a lot of respect for, uh, appointed me, we had an understanding that he did not get involved in any enforcement matters or permit matters. That was my job. Now, if you want to talk, get involved in policy, yeah, he's governor. He has a policy role, obviously, and we listen to him. And, but uh, I tell you, nine times out of ten, if he had an issue and he would push back on you, and, why are you doing this? He explained to the other side and said, well, you know, that sounds good, or I remember several times he said, "You know what? I wouldn't have done it that I won't. I wouldn't have done it that way, but it's your call." I never had difficulty in, you know, let's see, the, you know, the eight years I was secretary, six years under him, with in fact had feeling I was politically influenced to make a decision contrary to good natural resources management, and my employees did not feel it because I wouldn't let. They were protected by the top people in the agency. That is not the case. It evolved. You know, then we had uh, Governor uh, uh, Thorup, uh, and it became more political. Not nearly as much as now, and their, their policies were probably more pro-natural resources management. But it has changed dramatically in the last seven, eight years. Uh, in the, I have a lot of good friends in the Department of Natural Resources. I'm in their building once a week or so. A lot, I get phone calls from people. It's amazing the amount of decisions that they have to call the governor's office to make. Things I wouldn't, wouldn't even got to my level when I was sector. Maybe decided over in the governor's office. Um, another thing that has changed and it doesn't happen in every regulation, but you have far more, and sometimes almost total, regulations being written by the industry that's being governed. And one on one that's the most blatant has been, uh, it's a group, uh, all we can do is sue me, uh, Dairy Business Association, which is a large animal operations. They really have written a lot of the regulations that regulate them. 
And it became very public. It was on, in the newspapers. Um, if you're familiar with Kewanee County, it has car soils, limestone, uh, you know, porous bedrock, sinkholes, and shallow soil on top. And you've got a lot of these CAFOs. I think there's 16 CAFOs in small Kewanee County uh, spreading manure. Plus other farms spreading manure. It's not just large operations. Uh, and it was in the groundwater. I mean, literally, at this point in time, one third of the wells in the county are not drinkable. There's townships that have 50% of their wells not drinkable because of E. coli and benchmarks. Uh, and it's because of the manure spreading on shallow soils and very porous bedrock. Um, well, jumping ahead a little bit, but what finally happened on that is local citizens, and you'll hear about that later, working with uh, some statewide organizations, but an uh, advocacy group, legal group, and what's in front of advocates, petitioned EPA that DNR was not doing anything to protect their drinking water and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it was to the point there was an administrative hearing by an administrative law judge for a permit for the discharge of, of waste for land spread. <coughs> the administrative law judge actually said this was a total failure of environmental regulation that was being applied to what happened in Kiwanee County. That was independent judge after hearing the record of what was going on in Kiwanee County. I've never heard administrative law judge go that far. So in fact, these people petitioned EPA, EPA came in and um, uh, directed the Department of Natural Resources to develop land spreading specialized for this kind of sensitive area of <coughs> shallow soils. They were applying the same standards statewide, whether you had 20 feet of clay or two feet of loam. So DNR, DNR was forced, if they had an EPA, it was going to do it. Those standards um, DNR proposed um, earlier had been written by the Dairy Business Association, and they didn't work in Iwan County. But now when it came down to being ordered by EPA, to their credit once, DNR proposed to use it for sensitive soils other places, like the Central Sands, where you have a highly uh, permeable <coughs> aquifer, and they're going to apply in various places where there are other sensitive areas where you could have manure get down and crawl water easy. All of a sudden, DNR got a call from the governor. No, you'll just do it for the Kiwani County problem. You're not going to do it statewide. And there was an open records request by a newspaper, and it was very clear this is very clear business association had gone to the governor. The governor directed DNR, oh, you went too far. So that's why these standards won't apply anywhere else in the state. That is not unusual. You'll, it, when and previously, in previous administrations, when you had a new environmental rule, new statute passed, you needed new regulations to implement it. You put together a group made up of industry and citizens of conservation or environmental groups, local municipalities if they were affected, and they sat down and hammered it out. There's only one group at those table, those tables today. One thing that we focused on as the Wildlife Federation, no group can do everything, but one area we zeroed in on was enforcement. Now, I may have had something to do with my background. Um, and, but the Wildlife Federation, I want to talk about the Wildlife Federation. The reason I went to them is, one, they were a full spectrum group. 
There's a lot of great organizations out there. Uh, White Tails on Deer, Trout Unlimited, Rocky Mountain Elk. Uh, there's environmental groups that work in various areas. We work on them all. And we're multi-species. We're made up of 205 Sportsman's Club, which are made up of all the full spectrum of outdoors people and we have individuals, obviously many individuals, individual members that aren't sportsmen that belong to our organization. So I like the fact when I uh, was hired as an organization that could cover the full spectrum. But secondly, it was a group that got it. These were sportsmen, but their focus wasn't, okay, what's the size, size, we get involved in size limits and bay limits, those kinds of things, but very, uh, very rarely. They look at the big picture. They got the idea, and it always impressed me when I was secretary, is that you need clean water, you need good fish and wildlife habitat, you need good forest, or we should, shouldn't even talk about wildlife and fish. If you don't have those, the rest is irrelevant. <coughs> they had that. The other thing is, they've, they've had a demonstrate time, uh, they've got my back. Sometimes we get out there and um, say unpopular things when People come after me personally. I just bring along a board member to them. I've actually had a couple of times where public hearing after uh, bringing in some people, and someone who lives next to you know, well, Bob's no Ralph Fritch, I bring him in. I've had legislators come up, George, you don't have to bring him anymore. <laughs> 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 and Corky Meyer was another uh, that uh, made sure they understand that I was speaking for them and don't interpret it as speaking for myself. Um, one of the areas we worked on was enforcement. And I knew that inside out from my job. But we would do open records requests on how many enforcement cases would go to the Department of Justice. And those are sort of the pinnacle. Those are the ones that are the most important. You might have thousands of violations, but there are small paper violations, things like that. And you get some medial, mediums or whatever, but those that cause serious environmental problems or are really blatant, intentional. My favorite is the president of Menards, personally taking <laughs> hazardous waste home from his plant because he didn't want to ship it and putting it in his personal garbage. <laughs> That's on video. <laughs> <laughs> Million dollar fine. We wanted him prosecuted. And this one, the, the uh, Attorney General Doyle said, we'll prosecute the company criminally, but not him. I still think it was wrong to say, because it was really blatant. Uh, and he was very open about it. But anyway, but in average, every year that about 65 cases would go to the Department of Justice. The others would be resolved at a lower level. They'd get resolved, but not without, not without fines. Of forfeitures. Well, it was like a, it went off a cliff. The first year of this current administration, it was cut in half. And I love their. I, when asked, and we put it in press release, um, they said, "Well, uh, people are com complying with the law better now." That was amazing. What one year? <laughs> <laughs> I was born during the day, but it was not <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> and they made other comments about various things. And what they forget, what they don't understand is businesses want violators prosecuted. If you're in business making something, and your competitor is polluting, not going to take stuff to hazardous waste site, their product is cheaper. This is a level playing field argument. You'll hear what level playing field is a little bit later on in, in, in the presentation. Fish and wildlife violations, off dramatically. Uh, me, you know, down, depending on the violation, 28, 30, 50%. I'm not talking about small stuff. Deer shining, the things that people really get upset about. Hunting without a license. You know, those kinds of things. Um, one of the I talked about the situation where 
Uh, local citizens went to EPA because of the Hawaiian County and they are not doing safe drinking water act. There's been two other times that we've had to go to EPA. One was in western Wisconsin, we have frac sand. We've heard about that in mining. One of the issues with that is blowing dust and particulate emissions. You're talking about the sand. And there are standards, and it's based on size. 10 microns is the, the, the long-term standard in size, which is a larger particle that there's been in the state. But this is really fine sand. Uh, and Dana had not established one in this administration. It, was, it wasn't a serious problem until all these frac sand mines started up. And it became a problem. And Dana was asked by citizen groups to establish one for smaller particles, 2.4 microns. There were federal standards for it, they just hadn't been adopted in Wisconsin, and been a big issue. DNR refused to do it. Well, they went to EPA. EPA ordered them to do it. Something that had predated this administration is uh, that there were 75 components of our Clean Water Act regulations in the state that were no longer up to date or non-conformance with federal law. So EPA in 2012 uh, issued a letter uh, to the current administration fix it. Or we'll take back the administration clean the clean water program, discharge, the discharge program in the Clean Water Act. All industries and municipalities have permits issued by DNR, they, they would be issued by EPA. So mayors are going to have to go down to Chicago and deal with the federal agency rather than state agency. I don't think that's their favorite task, or if you're a businessman. Um, DNR was given a couple of years to do that. They still have not completed it. We're almost at 2018. Some were easy, some were a little bit harder. But some haven't even been started to be fixed on. Our group was one of the petitioners at the EPA to get that done. Um, we're a sports group. And one of the uh, issues that we've been working on are great concerns, chronic waste disease and the deer herd. A fatal disease. Very difficult to deal with, obviously. Uh, it's been entrenched in the state. Uh, and, and DNR, and this was, it was discovered after I was no longer secretary, shortly after that. Uh, clearly, they've been in the state for a while. Uh, the most likely source was it was brought in by a deer farm. You know, I still need to convince the deer walk from Wyoming. <laughs> the other argument is some hunter brought back a carcass had chronic wasting disease, and that's how it spread. Theoretically, that's possible. But if you knew how many deer were being moved around this country, even now, in trucks, you know, cattle trucks, you'd be amazed. Literally hundreds uh, are on the road right now, sometimes, between these deer farms because of crossbreeding and things of that nature are selling you know, good specimens to each other, whatever. Um, and they are really made a big push. There was pushback by sportsmen and the legislature. And they are stopped doing much. Well, that was many years ago. And it has spread in, you know, in the wild over many more uh, uh, counties. And it's it has spread in the deer farms. Lyons County is a long ways from Iowa County, Wisconsin. Uh, there's just one in Charles County. Uh, so, I mean, there's, those are here one in Portage County, Marathon County. Uh, and um, DNR has literally stopped doing anything but monitoring the spread of the disease. And their plan right now is, would tell you how bad it is. See that commercial 
I'm not a police, I'm not, you know, the bank, people going to the bank and it's being robbed. And then the guy looks like a security guard and he says, no, I'm a security monitor. That's what we have. Um, the governor we thought was going to do something about two years ago. She said, well, I'm really um, going to do something and I'm directing DNR, among other things. We had been trying to get DNR to update their plan. It was required to be updated. He, he climbed onto that to his credit. He ordered them to do it. And they had a great group together, including deer farmers and sports groups and veterinarians or whatever, came up with a good a, a plan that was agreed on. It was a year ago. They haven't done a thing with it. Uh, Eventually, that disease will spread throughout the state. Um, and it obviously, you know, a population level has been shown it does have impact on some of the western uh, herds. Um, I mean, deer and deer hunting is really part of the legacy of the state. Um, it's part of a significant part of the economy of the state. Um, and it is part of a major part of the sporting heritage of this state. It's a major asset, and it's being squandered. We sure really don't have the solution to it, but we can slow the spread of it. That should be the strategy they're not undertaking. The, and there is the um, outside chance, and it is an outside chance, that it can cross the barrier to humans. If you look at the health advisors, they advise you, if you're in an area that has chronic waste disease, have your deer tested. It's free testing. To their credit, the NR does that. Um, and the research is showing, uh, it's getting closer and closer. I think it's the, I may have mispronounced this. Macaque monkey? <coughs> Macaque. Macaque. Some, you're, not, you're, you're not a bird washer then, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There's been a test where it showed uh, it's, a, it's, come, it came, it's coming out of case washer. Um, and the criticism has been peer reviewed. That's because it, it's being peer reviewed right now. It should be out very shortly. That shows that they, and they're cl closer to us in terms of primates than chimpanzees and other species. This is getting closer to us genetically. Um, and they've shown that, obviously, it's gotten it through, you know, sometimes they put the prions into the brain. But in this case, they did that, but also through ingestion. And that's worrisome. I know I hunt in an area, uh, two areas, one in the CW area, one on the fringe. We had deer in our freezer the first year. We finished it. We figured it's too late anyway. <laughs> but we've tested every, every time since. And we, 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 we advise people to do it. Um, my wife wouldn't let a deer in the house today if it hadn't done. The agency really has become risk adverse. It will never get out in front of an issue that's tough um, or controversial. And I'm sorry, when you're dealing with natural resources management in the state, <coughs> there will be controversy. And that's because people are passionate about natural resources. Their use, their protection, and the job of the agency is here in the middle. I was secretary during the Crandon mine dispute. People call me anti-mining, people call me pro-mining. <laughs> we were going down that path, calling them as we saw them. And that's the nature of the job. Uh, they will not uh, get it stay as much far away as they can for being out front in, on these controversial issues. <coughs> the other thing is they're not transparent. We used to have employees talk to reporters about their work. There are mining regularly that could talk about what they're doing. 
if they were a wildlife manager, they could talk about the deer herd in the area to the media. Uh, thank you. Cold, That's fine. <coughs> I like my vodka more. I don't want to do it. But anyway, there used to be reporters could talk to our field people. We encouraged that. The only thing we did, and it was controversial, I did what I said, okay, tell us when you've talked to somebody so we don't read it in the paper first. <laughs> I didn't think it was unreasonable. There were some boys thought that that was censorship. Uh, that's a weird kind of censorship. We're going to know about it anyway, right? Um, but now that doesn't happen. There is one voice. If you hear Jim Dick, he's their voice. He's a nice man. I don't have anything against him. I've known him for many years. But he doesn't know the details of something. And uh, he often says no comment. He's in a position where he can't because he doesn't have knowledge or they don't want to. Or he'll give a very glowing statement. If it's a criticism about water quality, he'll talk about how they're so very strong about and interested in, in working hard to protect water quality. And there's just a pattern there. Um, and these are the people's natural resources. People are bad. I mean, you own the waterways, you own the wildlife. Uh, you have a right to find out what's going on and get answers to it. The media surely should. I viewed sometimes, although it was a challenge at times, I viewed the media as a conduit to get information on. They show on public radio once a month. Field any questions. I hated the ginseng questions. I didn't know they were <laughs> And people used to think of questions they asked me. That one was, I refused to answer ginseng. <laughs> but it was a chance to be unfiltered getting things out. For instance, a friend of mine, when I, it gave me a chance to explain the issues, or controversial issues, in our terms, in lay person's language. Um, they do not do that at all. There is no, um, no uh, tr transparency. It became very evident fairly on what the mission of the Department of Natural Resources was. The secretary would go out and speak to groups, generally being business groups, and say that her first priority was jobs. Okay, I understand the idea DNR has to be sensitive to economics and development. We have to live in the environment, the total environment of, of an economy. But no one that I ever heard of, and that was head of natural resources, said, that is our prime job. I thought that was the job of the Department of Commerce or the new Department of Commerce. Our job is to protect the environment and during that make sure that job creation can take place in a, and uh, remove unreasonable barriers to job creation. But our primary job is not job creation. The um, Hey, that's the Northeaster. Now let's talk about Hurricane, Hurricane Grace. <laughs> and that's the US EPA. We have someone that whose philosophy is antithetical, just the opposite of what the mission is of the US EPA. He's smart, he's a lawyer, he knows the ins and outs, and that is dangerous. Uh, Craig Pruitt, Attorney General uh, in Oklahoma, made his street creds suing the federal government, but especially the OCPA. He filed, and he was only done, I think, four or six years as Attorney General. He filed 14 lawsuits against the OCPA. <coughs> And what did the bad guys get away with in Oklahoma while this was going on? Uh, and he had many, he sued other federal agencies. It was just now. But that was the total focus of his agency was to challenge the federal government and implementation of federal laws. He's been secretary now 
nine and a half months, maybe a little bit less. Um, he has set aside the uh, water, uh, the Clean Water Act rules that have been uh, proposed and uh, under uh, the previous administration uh, to protect the headwater streams and wetlands, uh, expanding uh, those or reinterpreting those to be consistent with the Clean Water Act. Earlier version had been struck down by the Supreme Court in 19, or 2001. Uh, and the court gave direction on how, if they were going to be done again, how they had to connect, how they had to be done. And EPA took that as uh, their uh, mantra in and proposed some rules. Those have been set aside. Uh, the there are methane regulations. Of course, methane is a, a greenhouse gas far worse than carbon dioxide. I think. There are plenty of scientists here, so I better be careful. But my memory serves me as about eight times worse than carbon dioxide. Um, and at the uh, oil and or oil and gas wellheads. There's methane emitted, and plenty of legal authority to do this without getting into greenhouse gas uh, rules or climate change rules. Uh, EPA had adopted methane uh, standards that they would have to meet. Secretary Pruitt met with the industry. Shockingly, a week later, uh, suspended the enforcement of those regulations. <coughs> But to their credit, that's been taken to court and I think enjoined now. There's a pattern, though, of um, Secretary Pruitt. He's had a lot of meetings. 95% have been with industry. Um, in terms of conservation and environmental groups, he's met with two groups. He's met with hundreds of other groups, too. Nature Conservancy, I think it was National Audubon, was the other one. Some of you guys got in the door. <laughs> um, but, yeah, clearly it's, it's one-sided in how he does this. Um, the appointees he's making, and of course they come from the White House, um, are industry people, chemical industry, coal industry, um, Mining, other mining industry, all the key positions uh, are being uh, appointed from those industries. And I'm not saying you can't have an industry person take a job and do a good job, um, but it is rare that you'd see all the top positions in an environmental agency being industry people. I think it's healthy to have a, a good diverse group. We had outside people come in higher than within the agency and business experience and did brought a very good perspective to the job. But um, there's clearly a different uh, intent uh, with this. Let's talk about climate change. Oh, one of the first things he did, he looked at the mission of EPA and struck the word science. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> he, he has various science panels. He's dismissed half of the scientists on those panels. And he literally says, it's a quote, science should not drive policy. <laughs> Now, there's other things that go into policy besides science, obviously economics and religion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I'm the wrong, wrong person to be talking to. <laughs> the, uh, but clearly science, I mean he made it, he, when he was saying it wasn't, it was pretty singular. That doesn't have any business being involved in private policy, not to be a unit. Component of it. He is a climate denier, 
uh, in this extent. He says he does believe in climate change, uh, believes humans have little impact. And then goes on, okay, there's, I get that, some people, that's their belief. That's not the mission of the agency, but that's his personal belief, he has a right to do it. And he goes on, Hummer's a lawyer, right? Turns out, says, does not believe EPA has legal authority to regulate greenhouse gases which cause climate change. Remember the Supreme Court said you did. Of course, the Supreme Court that came down, this was challenged when under the Obama administration. The business groups took it up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, who's the Chief Justice? I forget. Roberts. Not Roberts. Roberts. Chief Justice Roberts wrote their opinion. Says you do. How can you as EPA Administrator say that? And it's because there's a lawyer. <laughs> One, one of these patterns when he turns back rules is it's usually after a meeting with the industry, Monsanto in some cases, or some regulations. He then does not go back and talk to staff. He just makes the decision. That's been reported. Uh, and staff are very frustrated uh, about that, that they were not consulted in making the decision. Uh, and some of these, I like to take the methane rule, there were reports, scientific reports, peer-reviewed information to, to adopt in the first place. When EPA does a rule, believe me, there's a stack of paper behind it. They weren't consulted. The reports weren't, weren't consulted. Um, he removed the climate change from the EPA website. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this, the way it was done in Wisconsin was really hilarious. Um, I mean, to the extent that literally it was one reporter on a small paper, the Lakeland Times, that drew that whole process of having climate change taken off the ER website. And it's been reported. And I know the reporter. Um, he, because one of my uh, people that criticized me a lot during the tree rights uh, dispute is still there. Bright guy, but literally he drove that whole train and got Secretary Step to remove climate change from the in our website. Dean, uh, EPA just developed their four-year plan. Good thing to do a four-year plan. Climate change is not mentioned in that plan. Why is this a perfect storm? Well, told you about how citizens have gone to EPA to get our DNR to do its job. What do you think will be happening on that next petition from Wisconsin Citizens Group to the US EPA? Our region in Chicago is Region 5 of the U.S. EPA. They haven't been told yet whether they're still going to exist. That they may be merged with Kansas City. <laughs> because that it was a very strong region. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've been marked out because of that. What does the world look like with a weak DNR and a EPA that won't make them total line? I'm an old guy, right? <coughs> <coughs> As Alan mentioned, I started with DNR in 1970, 12 days before Earth Day. <coughs> I was a law clerk then. They only had about three or four lawyers. Law clerks did a lot of work. It was a great experience. We got into it. It wasn't just doing research or paper shuffling. We actually got to do real legal things. Under supervision, because that's the state bar 
properly requires that. So I was assigned to work with a, we did a water pollution laws before the Clean Water Act was adopted in 1972. I was hired my permanent position under the first funds that came from the Clean Water Act, EPA, 1972, to be the enforcement lawyer at that time. <clears throat> but before that, for two years, I was assigned as a law clerk to work with a small group called the Orders of Limitation Group. In this state, we had a law where, in fact, there was, there were pollution laws in the state for 80, 90 years. Um, if you remember 1970, if you're in Stevens Point, you knew the water quality in Wisconsin was perfect. You had walleye, but you wouldn't eat them. There was a sulfur taste. I went to school in St. Norbert on the banks of the Fox River. We both had, both rivers have paper mills and municipalities as um, major municipalities. Burn Hall, where I went to school, was on the banks of the Fox River. Freshman, 18 year old kids, right? Once in a while, there'd be a kid thrown in the water. <laughs> Seriously, you came out with a rash within a day or two, or an ear infection. Or just avoid it. And this sounds like a punchline, but it's not. There were carp, but they came to the surface to breathe. I saw them. <laughs> and it was just, there was so much paper mill waste which ate up the, used up the oxygen. Yeah. There was little oxygen, so the only thing that lived in the river. Now, clean water rat, it's a world class walleye fish. Still some fish advisors, but not many. Uh, that's the power of sound environmental regulation. And every paper mill survived that. What's happened since then was, in the last few years, has been a world economy. Not the Clean Water Act. It doesn't change. Uh, but anyway, the Orders Implementation Group, we had these laws, and municipalities and industry were issued orders to clean up. The implementation group really didn't implement too much. Deadlines would come up. I think it's fair to say, thinking back, I, I, one of my friends I used to see at one of the athletic events at W. Ask him, and I check her question. 80, 90% of the time, we just extended the deadline. Why? But once the municipalities, they said we didn't have any money. There wasn't a lot of money. There was some under uh, the ORAP program that Gabriel Nelson started, but not a lot of money from the municipalities. And no one was going to make a municipality do anything if they didn't have the money. Came to the paper mills, as an example. The mantra was, and you'd get a call from, did calls from legislators or from the company itself or letter or lawyer, you make us put that in, we're going to Mississippi. <laughs> we're going to Georgia. We're going to Oklahoma. There was no APA backup. Clean Water Act came in. Standards applied uniformly across the country. A level playing field. They can't say that anymore. Same water quality standards are in Oklahoma and in Georgia, as there are in Wisconsin. That was the life before the Clean Water Act and before EPA. There will not be a level playing field if, in fact, we don't have a strong federal presence and requiring that the state comply with the federal laws that they said they would comply with. That's the picture of the future. I'm going to ask, what caused this? Okay, well, there's a lot of factors, and this is going to be overly simplistic. Um, the politics in our state, it's not just the natural resources, was taken over by business interest, I would say. And I know it's not most of the business in the state, but powerful trade groups, uh, outside organizations. 
that are funded by them, um, that have tremendous power, so and have had major impact on elections. The since in the United States has totally wiped out any constraints on corporate money uh, going into elections. I follow politics pretty closely. It's a, it's a political junkie. My wife is also. There's a U.S. Senate race coming up next year, right? Most people know that. Senator Baldwin's up for, for election. She's running. Uh, there's two candidates, primary candidates, strong candidates on the Republican side. Uh, State Senator Leah Vukmir, uh, another uh, business guy, former veteran, uh, former Democrat, Kevin Nicholson. I watch, you always follow the money, follow the money. And I'm not, I have nothing against these people. I, no, I know Leah, I do not know Mr. Nicholson. I have nothing against him, personally. But already lined up, now this is more than a year before the election. She has one billionaire behind her. Uh, Mrs. Hendricks from Beloit, the, uh, the roofing company. He's got three billionaires. Not many of some. He just came out the last one. Um, he had the U lines, who are actually Illinois. They have a business now in Kenosha County. Uh, they're the ones that did something up in West Lake Minor Talk we fought on. Uh, was first behind them. Secondly, um, Americans for Prosperity. That's the Koch brothers. So there's two billionaires, Mark Hoffman is one. And then today, uh, it was announced in the paper that uh, uh, Bannon, Steve Bannon, his group now, is supporting Nicholson. So that's his third. That's the Mercer money. They're all billionaires. How can people compete in that? I mean, don't even watch television from now until I <laughs> Can you imagine no. the ads? No. Uh, that's, I mean, that's obscene, yeah. but that's our system. Mm -hmm. uh, you see what happens in ju Supreme Court ju judicial races. Okay. The candidates have no say in the campaign. I mean, they're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars. There's millions flying around. Most, there's some money on both sides. But there's a lot of business money out there. And I I'm, I think constraints should be on whatever. I'm not speaking on business. There's some non-business money, but usually not as much. There should be constraints at all. It's very hard to win on that situation. Mm -hmm. The other issue is the issue I'm sure you pop the papers gerrymandering. This is a 50-50 state, believe me. and. Uh, the elections should be two to four percent. If you have, eight, have decent candidates uh, for on a statewide level, that should be a two to four percent difference. I mean, that's just the history of the last eight or nine statewide elections. Um, but on the assembly level, and even in the congressional level, there's gerrymandering. In that case, the Democrats and the Republicans agreed to gerrymander each other so they all save seats. There's no unsafe seat now on the congressional level. Um, and in the assembly, uh, both parties used to gerrymander, but in 2010, the current majority party did it to an art form, using extremely sophisticated computing and, and algorithms to do it. And it, you could not have made it a more one-sided uh, uh, set of uh, districts. They do it, I'm not going to go into it, the terms of cracking and packing are the way they pack districts to do that. So you had were the votes, if you looked at all the votes for Democrats, all the votes for Republicans, would be about equal. And there's one year that Democrats had slightly more, but still it's about a two to one in the assembly. That's hard. 
That's what we're facing. Now, I still have optimism. And it's because of people like you in this room. One power we have are as citizens, you know, organized or individually, to fight for conservation, whether it's an individual issue. Uh, you know, the folks uh, uh, in Saratoga uh, have, you know, and their issue over there we're sympathetic to for big different reasons. You saw the, uh, it was the Wisconsin Supreme Court, not our, it was a district court decision about uh, lake levels on several of the lakes in this area. <coughs> it was a citizens group that did that, lake group, uh, and some other citizens did that, got the court, used the state constitution, the public trust doctrine, which is in charge for state constitution, and basically got a state statute declared being applied appropriately because it was unconstitutional, and DNR does have the authority to put conditions on these high capacity wells. That was citizens. Um, DNR was on the other side of the case. Attorney General was on the other side of the case. They had an excellent lawyer who charged a lot less than he normally would, and they, but they paid him, and he won. And I read the decision, it is right on the law. Uh, I think that when in the appellate level, you know, the Supreme Court is pretty political these days. If they follow precedent, there's no way the Lake District should lose. I mean, the whole case is citing Supreme Court decisions, some of them recent. And the Lake Bueller case was sort of uh, President came down a few years ago. That was written on a Republican appointed uh, court. Not quite as stacked as uh, this one, but you know, if they're true to their word that they follow precedents, this is a slam dunk in the Lake District. It's a shame that has to happen, but that's where we're going to win a lot of these things. A lot of what's happening in EPA is going to be challenged in court by attorney generals across the country and much of it will be held up, struck down. <clears throat> groups like Midwest Environmental Advocates uh, and other groups in Wisconsin, because litigation, we don't. We file the Mika Security Act briefs, but uh, we don't have the wherewithal to uh, be involved in litigation, uh, have been winning lawsuits. And that's what we're going to do until we get the political system straightened out. Uh, and I think we can get the political system straightened out. It's going to be harder to deal with the money issues. But this case before the Supreme Court, the gerrymandering, we're going to win that one. The citizens are going to win that one. It's going to be a five to four decision with Justice Kennedy writing the decision. How good are your predictions? <laughs> <laughs> I got fired. <laughs> That's a reason. You, I mean, you've got the normal 4-4 split. But Kennedy, in fact, said, I do believe you can have, it's wrong, you can have political gerrymandering, and it's wrong. And he didn't rule in that case five, six, eight years ago. He said because there was no objective test. So this whole case was set up with algorithms and, you know, statisticians, professors. And they have a, there's a series of options. They can pick one of them, you know? And the other thing is, and I'm a lawyer, so I'll watch the court a little bit. Um, during the oral argument, Kennedy has a tendency on these controversial cases. If he doesn't ask a side a question, they're going to win. He grills the other side. And in this case, he did not grill the state the citizens that probably was and say work. And I, I've seen that. I mean, there's people that really studied the court. So they had this great article that showed, you know, like 80, 90 percent of the time, that's his pattern. There's people that actually track this. <laughs> you know, so I'm glad they do. But that was the end there. And it's what he wrote in his previous Could be wrong, but uh, I think the, um, there is a tendency. 
that much open up questions. Matt? George, do you uh, have time for questions? I sure do. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no ginseng. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Senate Bill 395, but Senator Patrick Tustin has uh, put some amendments on it. Yep. I don't know what those amendments are, uh, and, and that, that is still for those of you that might not know it's dealing with the non money. money. Uh, how do you feel about those amendments? Do they put your mind at ease? This one is controversial, I'll tell you why. Um, we helped write those amendments. The, on this one we went, we, one of the positions we take as a wildlife federation is we follow the science and, and professional judgments on things. I regulated four mines when I was at DNR. I'm not a scientist regulator, but I, I know a lot about mining regulation and the current mining laws. I talked to two former, in fact, we one volunteered work for us, um, two mining regulators, geologists, hydrogeologists and geologists, together 50 years of experience. When this bill first came out, Senator Tiffany's bill, we were strong opponents of the iron mining bill, the first mining bill. Terrible. It's a terrible law right now. We, we, we've got a resolution that changes if we get over figure out how to get the votes. I was amazed when this bill came up. It wasn't too bad. There were three provisions we thought were bad. Our strategy was we could go in like everybody else and just oppose the bill. And there's a provision in there, if it stayed in the bill, we would have switched to a polls. We came in for information only, for many information purposes. We laid out the three problems we had with the bill. They knew we had consulted with these mining regulators. A week later, my good friend, Tom Tiffany, called. <laughs> said, George. Would you be willing to sit down with some mining people and myself and represent Hutton, some of the sponsors, and try to address those issues? We did. And I had my expert there. Um, and one thing I want to indicate on this the iron mining bill, you remember Go Give Me Taconite? They weren't a mining, they were a coal company. They had never done a mining. Bill. They didn't know what they were doing. No other mining company came in in favor of their bill. And we were talking to those other mining companies. They were embarrassed. They were afraid what it would do for the industry. Those were the people that were at the table. And they were talking straight tech, engineering, and science to my guy. And I had another woman who was not there, but we talked to her on the phone. The amendments addressed the issues we had. And I would say, and I say this very carefully, but seriously, I wouldn't say it otherwise, that you gotta remember, this bill only dealt with what, 11 sections of the current mining law, which has 100 sections or more. It was a very small slice. Our current mining law before this bill was very strong. With this bill as amended, it gives DNR regulators all the tools they need to ensure that the environmental standards will be met. I feel very confident saying that, having regulated four mines, and so are the other people. There's other groups, and I'm not faulting them, that didn't pivot when the bill came on, and we did. Um, I think it's going to pass. Um, it probably would have passed without those amendments. And there was one provision in there, if it had been passed, we'll be to the environment and taxpayers 60, 80 years down the road. Um, and we got that fixed. Other 
Yes, ma'am. Just a question. Um, if we can't trust DNR to regulate and a bill like this gets passed, what good are DNR regulations? Well, when it gets to the, or DNR is, doesn't do its job, it's usually at the policy level. I have found working with with Dean, our frontline staff on the environmental programs, they're still making the right decisions. I mean, there's a law, they follow it, and um, they're not being told how, what the final decision should be. Now, the top level will try to change what the regulations are, and we fight that, but with strong regulations, I have confidence that Dean, our professional staff will implement those. And there are going to be watchdogs. Believe me, any mining project, there is nothing more. Deer management and mining are the two most controversial <laughs> things. <laughs> I age to defend mining. Yes. On the topic of mining, I actually have two questions. The first sure. one on the mining. Um, the proposed sulfide mine in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is yeah. near the Menominee River, yes. which is a state boundary. Therefore, in my limited knowledge, it seems to me that the EPA should be involved because it's very close to this river. Uh, yes, very close. Yeah, and so um, why shouldn't the EPA from District 5 or Region 5 uh, take an active role in, uh, in this regulation? The, and it's the, the back 40 mine. The Wisconsin Wildlife Federation has opposed that mine. And our major concern is how close it is to the river. Um, and the Menominee River is an outstanding bass fisher. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, it is probably one of the best bass fishing areas in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. come from all over the country. I told you that, so you can go out there and all the people that fish them. It also has a sturgeon recovery program, uh, which a lot of that work is done upstream, but the fish migrate. And the idea is uh, to help restore not just the fish in the Miami River, Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Now, a lot of money has gone into that. Nonprofit and DNR money. And Michigan DNR money. Um, EPA steps in on those situations if there is a dispute between the states. The state of Michigan consulted with the top brass of DNR, and they're on the same page. Okay, so they're be doing that one. But yeah. EPA won't come in if there's their job is to to solve disputes between states if it's a boundary one, and there isn't any. They typically don't say this is a sulfide mine. They say this is a gold mine, a silver mine. And sulfide is 97% of the table. It's a sulfide ore, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, my knowledge is that there has never been a sulfide mine that has been closed for 10 years without polluting the environment. There has been none in all of history. I would disagree with that. There's uh, some more staff, former staff of Dino would say, would disagree with that. Um, you hear about the flammable mine? Now, I don't think the flammable mine shows a lot to either side of this debate. It was open for four years. Yeah. It didn't yeah. have a tailings facility. It was a very small mine compared to very the small mine. ten times bigger than that. Uh, to the extent it was a mine, uh, it had ore body was open that was had sulfide ore in it, sulfide uh, tailing, not tailings, but overburden was put back in and it sulfide in. Um, there were minor exceedances, but any DNR staff would tell you it was a success story. And there's even controversy. There is a stream called Stream C. I've seen, so you know this is not fly fishing country, right? Um, but that whole area has, in its geologic structure, has heavy metal. And there's some exceedances there in that stream. Never impact the Flamel River. But there are exceedances upstream too. So the thought is it could well be just from a natural geologic 
structure through which it runs. But they're actually minor. So the I know people try to, when it was taken to court, the clerk did find that there were some violations. Judge Crabb, who is a very environmentally sensitive judge, um, some would criticize her for being on the left. I think she's an excellent jurist. <coughs> After that, she found them guilty of some violations, but said it just went on for pages all the great job they did and fined them 250 bucks. But she didn't think it was significant. It went to the appellate court, and the appellate court said there weren't any violations. So uh, it's used as an example, but I, I really stress to people that doesn't tell me, that mine doesn't tell me anything in terms of Crandon mining. And the trouble with the, you know, the, the, the mining moratorium law, there were some problems to it. And I, I don't know if you remember, when I was DNR secretary, I opposed the bill when I was secretary, because, not because of political reasons. My staff told me it was not valuable. And I'll tell you, it says, any, you have to look to any mine in North America. So a mining company went out, Found three mines. One was in the desert in Arizona. You couldn't find groundwater. <laughs> you wouldn't have enough pipe to find it. <laughs> Two was in the permafrost and none of it, in the Northwest Territories. And the third was in the Sierra, the Foothill Mountains, the Sierra and the Mountains. Yeah, not comparable. Yeah, I looked at the swamps of Forest County and said, that was going to help us. So um, we did deal with that in. That was an issue we dealt with, one of the amendments. And I testified on this a week ago. All we said is the mining company has to come in and show that there's the technology they're proposing is capable of meeting environmental standards. That's all you need. And people said, well, and when I stress my testimony, this is a theoretically technical. The first thing any mining regulator will be, show me. So they're going to ask the same question that the mining moratorium bill law got at. <coughs> show me where that's worked. The other thing is restricting it just to mines. The tailings facility is where you got the pollution problems. That's where you got, got the caps so the rain doesn't get in to get at that sulfide ore mm -hmm. spillage in the groundwater. That's what happens in these mines. I go to a hazard waste site, use their technology. That's as tough as what you're going to need for a tailing facility. There are other applications that can be transferred to a mining operation that will prevent environmental standards from being violated. You couldn't do that under money more time law, too. Was it helpful? Would you please reflect on conservation values at the heart of Wisconsin? And any changes, if any, you have noticed in your your seasons of service? This state has some of the strongest, and I'm not just talking, all states have people with conservation values. This state, it's more generic to the population. There's several reasons for that. Um, One, we have a lot of resources. People have used those resources. We have this public trust doctrine, which people know about, that in fact the waterways belong to the citizens. And even the state legislature can't do something. They pass a law. They try to drain the Horicon Marsh for, for agriculture. The Supreme Court says, no, you can't. That doesn't belong to you, legislature. It belongs to the citizens. You're just the trustees. You're violating the trust. That has been that that has been ingrained in our psyche in the state. The wildlife, the in fact, they're owned by the state. We've had processes that have reinforced that. Talk about pl difficult political times. 1920s. Cronies were. Um, can't believe. Back to the Future, right? Um, <laughs> governors would appoint cronies to be non-professionals as head of the conservation department. 
Sportsmen didn't like it. The Isaac Walton thing, there may be some angst in this room. Great group, was the premier group at that time in the state. They, along with leaders such as Haskell Noyes, uh, Bill Aber, uh, Elmer Leopold, got pretty darn angry and got political. And they basically interjected themselves, I don't think, they, in the election of 1928, elected a governor, governor named Zimmerman who said he was going to appoint a citizen's commission and have a sign, have a professional be appointed by him to run the conservation department. He got elected on that. It's getting the end of his two-year term and he wasn't doing it. They went to him and said, you want to be governor again? Do it. And that's how the Conservation Department Commission got created in 1928. And since then, we've had this Conservation Commission and DNR board where any citizen in the state can go at their meetings. And when I was sitting at that Trump table, people signed up for citizen participation. It was like in a job performance evaluation every month. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sometimes it's good and usually not. Um, but that's powerful. In addition, we have the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. Only state in the country has that. Every hunting fishing regulation and other environmental policies get voted on on the first Monday of April. Doesn't have any other place. A citizen, Bob, Bob or Bob, or any one of you, can have a good idea, go to a their local session, put in a resolution. It wins in that county, then goes to a study committee, and a study committee for warm water or trout makes sense, and DNR talks about the science. If it makes sense, it gets put on a statewide ballot. And then it gets voted on statewide. And in fact, if it gets passed, 95 to 90.9% .9 of those are elevated by DR. That's our citizen development. So that's, we, there was a strong ethic to start with because of natural resources being, but it's been reinforced by all these other dimensions <coughs> and institutions. We can't forget that. So is it the same today? Do you see it the same uh, today? In terms of citizens, yeah. Okay. No question. There's citizens groups on near, near Myriad of issues. I get emails, will you help us out? Of well, we can't do it at all, but there is a lot of good activity going on. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to put in a plug for Conservation Congress because a lot of the people here that don't go should be going because there are issues that you can register on and it doesn't take a lot of effort. In fact, I think we'll have something in the couple hours on a Monday, one month in year. April. But, uh, <laughs> Go, it's a real, real experience, and, and you can have input on issues that you're interested in. George, uh, can you stick around and uh, sure. talk to people? Uh, it's getting a little late. We had a choice of either dismissing people to go get their cots for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm running out of this <laughs>